name is Michael Barker. I'm a professor at the University of Wyoming, but I'm also the director of education for the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance. So following John's pricing study, uh, the second presentation today is on the economy of steel bridges, considering first costs again, just like he did, but then also life cycle costs. And I did see a, a question in the chat on life, uh, related to life cycle costs. So we're gonna deal with that directly. So here's the plan for my part of this webinar. I'm gonna introduce the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance because you've been hearing about it a lot. And I just wanna, I wanna make sure you understand what it is again, its purpose and its functions. Of course, one of its functions is to represent the design and construction of simple span steel bridges. And as part of that, we are going to look at cost competitiveness of steel bridges for first costs and then life cycle costs. So the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance is an industry support alliance that is a group of bridge and buried soil structure industry leaders who have joined together to provide educational information on the design and construction of short span steel bridges up to 140 feet. The purpose is to help owners and design engineers with designing and building simple span steel bridges. The Alliance was formed to address two main concerns and you already heard about one of those concerns. The first is the misconception across the United States that for shorter span bridges, concrete is always less expensive than steel. The second issue is that concrete, br a concrete bridge is easy to design using charts and tables, whereas a steel bridge design is an individual piece of art for each design. So the Alliance has developed economical studies that address the first cost and life cycle costs of steel and concrete bridges, and you just saw John's presentation that show both steel and concrete bridges are competitive. And the goal is to break that preconception that concrete is less expensive. And we're gonna look at some of those studies here. The Alliance has also developed those standard simple span steel bridge designs that John talked about. And we saw in, in webinar two uh, called eSpan 140. So that you can get a design, a steel design and lay it next to that concrete design in just a matter of minutes. So we're going to start with that preconception that concrete bridges are less expensive than steel in the short span market. Many owners and engineers believe this to be true. And many times steel is not even considered when there is a short span bridge need. This is unfortunate because that means owners may be paying more for their bridges than is necessary. If owners and engineers would compete steel and concrete bridges, the cost for both would be lower due to the competition. In fact, studies show that states or regions that do not even consider steel alternatives and only build concrete bridges pay more for those concrete bridges than states or regions that have a healthy competition between the two bridge materials. So now we're gonna look at case studies. We're gonna look at a county bridge or some county bridges and state bridges. This first case study is from Audrain County, Missouri from the year 2012. These two bridges were built by an Audrain County work crew. So there is no contractor for the bridges. This is a special case study in that the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance worked with the county engineer from before construction through the opening of the bridge to track costs. The steel bridge on the left consists of four steel girders, a 47 and a half foot span, 24 foot roadway width, and a two foot structural depth. The concrete bridge on the right consists of six precast hollow core slabs. It does have a little longer span at 50 and a half foot but the same 24 foot roadway width and the same structural depth of two feet. These two bridges were built in the same year and are nearly identical, except for a small difference in the span length. So the engineer was asked to keep a detailed account of the cost for the construction of the two bridges so that a direct comparison could be evaluated. This shows the total costs of these two bridges where the costs are broken down into material, labor, equipment, guardrail, rock, and engineering. We can see that for the total costs of these two bridges, the steel bridge has a 19% savings over the concrete bridge. The costs are calculated based on the square footage of the deck area for the equivalent comparison since the concrete bridge was three foot longer. However, comparing only total costs can be deceiving given the different site characteristics of the two bridges. 
For instance, we see here that the concrete bridge had significantly high engineering costs than the steel bridge and lower rock costs than the steel bridge. So since we were doing this before these were built, the engineer was also asked to separate out only the superstructure costs so that an equivalent direct comparison could be made for the two bridges. These costs represent the costs associated with only the superstructure. So this is a true apples to apples comparison of the cost for these concrete and steel bridges. Removed from the total cost is all site prep work and grading and engineering and rock abutments and so forth. And we can see the costs for the materials, labor and equipment for only the superstructure. And we see that the bridge costs 37 and a half bucks per square foot and the concrete bridge comes in at $50.60. $50 the steel bridge is considerably less expensive for this comparison. Now, one item to note is the equipment cost where the steel bridge used a county owned 30 ton crane. The concrete bridge girder members are heavy and the county had to rent a 100 ton crane at a cost of $3,500. The other $500 for each of the bridges was a rented skid steer for incidental work. However, even if the county needed to rent the 30 ton crane, that cost would have been about 1520. That increases the steel bridge cost to only 38.88 per square foot, still considerably less than the concrete bridge cost. Now the steel girders and the steel bridge are weathering steel that requires no painting and these costs are already in the cost of the steel girders. If the county needed additional corrosion protection and used galvanizing, the cost would have been approximately at that time 22 cents per pound of steel and the steel bridge total cost would still be significantly less than the concrete bridge costs. So for these two bridges, as they were built, the superstructure only costs show that the steel bridge option would have a savings of over 25% compared to the concrete bridge. That is five steel bridges for the cost of four concrete bridges. This is for two almost identical bridges where they have the same structural depth which means no difference in approach work, the same roadway width, the same guardrail system, the same abutments, and the same county crew built both bridges. So this demonstrates that steel is competitive with concrete and that that preconception that concrete is always less expensive is just plain incorrect. Steel short span bridges can and many times will be less expensive than a concrete option. The reason for these economies for steel bridges vary over the bridge fabrication and construction process. For instance, we saw that one reason steel is competitive is that equipment requirements are less since steel bridge components are considerably lighter than the concrete components. For steel bridges, the dead load is significantly lighter and lighter abut abutments can be used or even some of the more economical modular abutment systems can be employed, you know, like geosynthetic reinforced soil systems. Another benefit for the economy of steel bridges is the use of partial depth precast panels or corrugated metal deck systems that make the casting of the concrete deck efficient. Now we know that steel is versatile. It's a versatile material and that steel bridges can be made in many forms with complicated details and fabrication. However, these simple bridges do not require complicated stiffener and diaphragm details. Simple details are cost effective, easy to fabricate and easy to erect. Another costly component for bridges are rocker or pot bearings at the girder ends. For these simple bridges, simple elastomeric bearings can be used and smaller bearings can be used due to the lighter weight of the structure. And of course, jointless decks with integral abutments leads to much lower deterioration rates and maintenance costs in the future. Finally, one of the costs for steel bridges is corrosion protection, since unprotected steel rusts. However, weathering steel, when applicable, is low cost and requires little maintenance for long-term corrosion protection. If weathering steel is not applicable, galvanizing, metallizing, painting, or even the use of stainless steel may be a cost-effective method for corrosion control. So that was one example. 
The Alliance also worked with that county engineer on other bridges built near the same time frame. This table looks at the total constructed cost of an additional five steel and four concrete bridges built in Audrain County. At the bottom of the table, the last row, we see that sometimes steel is less expensive and sometimes concrete is less expensive. This is healthy competitiveness and is good for the owner. These are examples of county bridges that show that both steel and concrete are competitive in the short span market and both should be considered. Next, we're gonna look at a couple of state bridges in Missouri. Here are two nearly identical bridges, one steel and one concrete that cross over the same highway near Columbia, Missouri, where I used to live. Both are two span with the concrete bridge just a little longer and wider. So the total cost will again be divided by the deck area for that direct comparison. These were both design bid build projects with a contractor constructing the bridges. Here are the costs for the two bridges. Both had non-bridge items such as conduit systems, a pedestrian fence, and an architectural facade because it was an entrance bridge to the city. And these costs shown in green here were removed from the total cost since they, they're, they're not structural. So at the bottom in the circles, we see that the concrete bridge costs 77.71 per square foot and the steel bridge costs 72.94. Steel beat concrete here. However, there is a five year difference in when these two bridges were built. So to account for the age difference and inflation, an engineering news record construction cost index of 2.7% per year was used to bring the cost of both of the bridges up to a common year of 2017. We see that the steel bridge was less cost at 85.58 than the concrete bridge at 91.18. So what we have, so from what we have seen here, and with many more examples that I could have shown, but because of time could not, we see that steel is competitive with concrete bridges in the short span market, and that owners and engineers should consider both materials for their bridge needs. That preconception that concrete is less expensive than steel in the short span market is a misconception. Both steel and concrete are competitive and competition is good for the owner and the public. But first cost is just that, the cost for putting the bridge in place. Responsible owners are also concerned about future maintenance costs and service life. The question about life cycle costs routinely comes up. Well, what is actually asked is, which type of bridge is best for life cycle costs? And both the steel industry and the concrete industry have offered anecdotal evidence, but has not, I'd like to think until now, had good evidence on which bridge type is best. So a study was conducted that examines the historical life service, meaning performance and maintenance, and historical agency life cycle costs, meaning the true cost for building and maintaining the bridge over its life, of steel and concrete bridges in Pennsylvania. The historical study was conducted so that the results show what actually happened to the bridges instead of anecdotal guesswork from the steel and concrete industries. Pennsylvania DOT had good records on their bridges and offered PennDOT data for the study and we certainly appreciated it. To determine a life cycle cost for a bridge, one needs to know the full history of that bridge. This includes the initial cost in the year it was built and all maintenance that occurred over the life, including department maintenance and contractor maintenance, and the lifespan of the bridge or when it will be replaced. Of course, all the bridges in the PennDOT database were still in service, so an end of life model was needed to estimate the life of the bridge and we'll see that coming up. The study's objective was to compare life cycle costs of typical concrete and steel bridges so there were criteria that each bridge had to meet to be included in the study. The criteria included considering only typical steel and concrete bridges where that was selected as precast I-beam, precast box where the boxes were adjacent to each other, precast boxes where the boxes were spaced apart, steel rolled beam and steel plate girder bridges, very similar to John's study earlier. 
In addition, both precast concrete became a mainstream construction method and modern steel design and detailing started in about 1960. So bridges built after 1960 were considered. Each bridge that was used in the database had to have complete records for initial costs and date built and accurate dates and costs for any type of department or contractor maintenance. And then the costs were based on the PennDOT recorded costs. PennDOT has over 25,000 bridges in their database. Of those, almost 8,500 are of the five types considered in the study. And of the 8,500, over 6,500 were built between 1960 and 2010 for a potential study base. When the 6,587 bridges were subject to the criteria, many of them did not have accurate and complete life history information, which left a database of a little over 1,700 for the life cycle cost study. This is over 25% of the potential bridges represented in the life cycle cost study, which is pretty good representation. All of the 1700 bridges are still in service. So a bridge life model needed to be developed to predict when the bridge would be taken out of service or replaced. And so we start up here on this slide on the top right. The model is based on the inspection superstructure condition rating which varies from zero to nine, nine being a perfect bridge. So it was assumed that the bridge had a rating of nine when it was built. A deterioration rate was determined based on the condition rating in the year 2014 by, by, by the change in condition divided by the years. With the deterioration rate, the remaining life could be estimated by assuming the bridge would be replaced when the superstructure condition rating became a three and the bridge life is the sum of the remaining life added to the current age. So down here, this table is the first results table from the life cycle cost study. It shows the average deterioration rates for the five types of bridges for not only the 1700 bridges, but the over 8,500 potential bridges. There is no reason to not use those for the deterioration rates. So for this presentation, when these results tables are shown, there will be two aspects of the results mentioned. First, the top two best performing types of bridges will be highlighted like it is down here on the bottom right. For instance, here, steel rolled beam bridges have the lowest deterioration rate of 7.1% of a condition rating per year, and precast spread boxes is second with an 8% deterioration rate. The second aspect is the statement at the bottom left that says all are similar with none way out of balance. The results show that the deterioration rates for the five types of bridges are not far off from each other. There is no one type of bridge that greatly outperforms the others, nor is there a type that is significantly less than the others. And I will address this statement, all are similar with none way out of balance towards the end of the presentation. So now we're going to look at a life cycle cost analysis for an example bridge to demonstrate the work of the study. The bridge is a precast spread box bridge built in 1969 with three spans and a deck area of 7,600 square feet. In 2014, the base year of the study, the superstructure condition rating was a five. Knowing that the average deterioration rate for spread box bridges is 8%, the estimated remaining life when the condition rate rating reaches a three is 25 years. Given that the bridge is 45 years old in 2014, the predicted lifespan for the bridge is 70 years. Next, the top of the slide shows the actual years and costs for the initial construction and the maintenance over the lifespan. I chose a simple one, so there's not too many maintenance events here. The actual costs are divided by the deck area for that comparison to other bridges. To compare life cycle costs over the database, inflation has to be taken into consideration. So all of the bridges were assumed to be built in 2014 and all of the costs inflated by the engineering, engineering news record construction cost indices, like we saw for that earlier case study. So this bridge in 2014 dollars costs $143.45 to build, and the maintenance costs in 2014 dollars, shown at the bottom here, 
uh, occurred at years 19, 40, and 44 after 2014. The study used constant 2014 dollars for all of these future costs since the discount rate in the life cycle cost analysis considers inflation for the future. So now we can lay out that life cycle for the bridge with dates and costs in 2014 dollars using a discount rate from the Federal Office of Management and Budget of 2.3% that takes into consideration inflation of the future 2014 dollar costs, a present value cost of the bridge's life cycle can be determined by discounting future costs to 2014, and it comes out to be $154.49 per square foot. This means that if $154.49 was put away when the bridge was built, the amount could pay for the initial costs and all future costs for that bridge cycle. However, we cannot compare the present value cost of a bridge that lasts 70 years, like this one, to a bridge that lasts only 40 years because the outcomes are not equal. So in life cycle costing, a way to compare different lifespan bridges is to use perpetual present value costs, also called capitalized costs, by assuming the bridge is replaced after each cycle in perpetuity. For this bridge, the capitalized cost comes out to be 193.97 per square foot, which again means that if that amount was put away today, it could pay for the first cycle bridge, and then what was remaining would grow back up and replacement of that bridge would be paid for every 70 years forever. And then with capitalized costs, we can now compare all of the bridges in the database directly. So now we're starting to get ready to analyze the results and to further make sure the study compared only typical bridges for the five types of bridges, bridges that had capitalized costs outside of one standard deviation from the mean of the bridge type were removed. Now I did that, I did this study, I did that but I tell you right now, it didn't matter. If we would have left them all in, it wouldn't have made any difference. This left almost 1,200 bridges of the five different bridge types that were used to study the results. So the bridge database was organized by bridge type in three Excel worksheets for each type. The first worksheet was the bridge information with location, year built, number of spans, bridge length, deck area, geometry, and bridge materials. The second was the department and external contractor maintenance performed on the bridge. And the third was the initial and life cycle cost results. And then studies and a final report were produced from the database of bridges. The report considered bridge life and capitalized costs where the capitalized costs were studied for several variables as shown here. Now we're only gonna look at bridge life and capitalized costs for the entire database and capitalized costs for the short length bridges as shown in the light blue. But the full detailed report can be found at www.shortspansteelbridges.org. After this was completed, an additional study was performed to look at the life cycle costs of galvanized steel girder bridges. And that report can also be found at the website. So the results. For bridge life, the database of the five types of bridges show that the rolled beam bridges have the longest predicted life at a little over 81 years. And second was the precast spread box bridges at just under 80 years. However, if we look at those numbers, none of the bridge types varied much from the others with a, with a seven year spread. And at the bottom left is that statement that all are similar with none way out of balance. So these are averages. A good way to look at predicted life that considers not only the average life, but also the standard deviation of the life is a statistical cumulative density function or CDF. Here, it is assumed that the data is normally distributed. And with the CDF, the question can be asked, what is the probability that a given type of bridge will last at least 75 years? 
with 75 years being the expectation for modern bridge construction. The results show that there is a 73% chance that a rolled beam bridge will last at least 75 years and a 65.6% .6 chance that a precast spread box bridge will. However, it also shows according to this data, there's only a 44.3% chance that a precast I-beam bridge will last 75 years or more. Now to the capitalized costs or the perpetual present value costs. This table shows the results for capitalized costs for all the bridges in the database. Here we see that the precast I-beam bridge has the lowest capitalized costs and the steel rolled beam is second. The table also shows the initial costs and the present value costs of all future maintenance, shows the average length, it shows the average number of spans, average year built and average life. This is where we need to be careful with the comparisons. Directly comparing all of the bridges without considering the differences in these variables can lead to misleading results. For instance, plate girder bridges in the database have an average of over four spans per bridge, whereas adjacent box precast bridges average just over one span per bridge. Number of spans along with average length of the bridge has a significant impact on, impact on costs. And in a couple of slides, we're going to examine a more consistent set of bridges based on span length for a more consistent comparison. And of course, all of these variables are addressed in the full report that is on the website. However, for the full database results, we can use the CDF again to ask the question, what is the probability that a bridge type has a capitalized cost less than $300 per square foot? And the results show that there's a 93% chance that a precast I-beam and an 88% chance that a steel rolled beam bridge have capitalized costs less than $300 per square foot. So the short span steel bridge lines define short span as simple spans 140 foot or less. This table reduces that full database to only bridges with lengths of 140 foot or less. It does not restrict it to simple spans, but only by length. The full report does look at just simple spans. There's much more consistency in the average length and the average number of spans, which makes for a better comparison than the full database results. Here we see that, like John's study that he showed earlier, that steel rolled beam bridges has the lowest capitalized cost at 266.24 per square foot, with precast spread box bridges coming in at 272.64. However, there's still that statement that all are similar with none way out of balance. Most of those costs are pretty close to each other. The plate girder bridges are a little high, I admit that, but that would be expected in these short spans since they're not, they are not as economical below about 80 feet. And these bridges would certainly include many bridges less than 80 foot in length. So back to that original questions from question from owners. Which type of bridge is best for life cycle costs? Is it the precast box where the boxes are adjacent to each other? Is it steel plate girders? Is it precast boxes where the boxes are spread? Precast I-beam? Or is it steel rolled beam bridges? And this is where we come back to that statement that all are similar with none way out of balance the overall weighted average capitalized cost for the five types of bridges is 252.40, showing up there kind of at the top middle. Each bridge type average is within 14% of that weighted average. There's not a huge spread there. Now, looking at the standard deviations for the different bridge types, they range between 48 and $65 per square foot, or a better way to look at that is coefficients of variation range from 20 to 25%. So if the bridge average range is only 14% and the coefficient of variations is between 20 and 25%, what that means in statistics is that any one bridge type may be the most economical for a given bridge project. There is no one bridge, no one type of bridge that clearly beats the others. 
So the conclusions of the life cycle cost study are, typical concrete and typical steel bridges are competitive on initial costs, future costs, life cycle costs, and bridge life. For any given bridge project, concrete or steel bridge types may be the most economical. Again, that preconception that concrete is always less expensive is a misconception. And then bolded here at the bottom, it says, owners should consider both steel and concrete alternatives for individual bridge projects. Competition between steel and concrete bridges is healthy for the bridge industry, the owner, and the public. And with that, I'm going to show this slide. I know you saw it last time with Mark Story's case study, but I encourage you to visit the shortspansteelbridges.org website to see how the Shortspan Steel Bridge Alliance can help you with your bridge needs.